Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to come to Oklahoma for the first time, also only remotely. Um, so it, it's very late my time, so I decided to do um, a mostly a, a, a picture-based talk. So, um, so I'm going to explain a little bit what are my thoughts about modular representation theory and my thoughts about modular representation theory in this specific example of SL2. You will see it, you will see lots of pictures like this. So it will be, I hope it will be a lot of fun and you will be able to understand it. And everything today is kind of based on, on joint work with, with several people. One of them, uh, Giroux, who actually was a, was a uh, grad student in Oklahoma, which makes me very happy. So this is how things come together. Um, and I decided to talk a little bit about this um, joint work in, in progress because it, it, it should give you a good, good idea of what I'm usually thinking about and how I think about things and, and whatever. But of course, most of all, I would be very happy if you would just uh, enjoy the talk. So the idea for my talk today is I start explaining a little bit my thoughts about what is representation theory, why do I care, and maybe why you should care. Um, and then I will show you a little bit why it gets very interesting in, in, the, in the modular case. The modular case basically just means um, you have some field of finite characteristics. So you're working modulo P. Okay, um, let me just start by kind of explaining, as I said, what I think about representation theory, what, what it is and why I, why I care. So I have this little nice table here and it will stay here for a while. But basically um, the idea, the whole idea of representation theory in my opinion is that almost everything you will ever see in your, in your life, in your mathematical life, in whatever, um, might come in, in, in actually two incarnations. Like, like an abstract incarnation and the kind of a real life incarnation. And all of you know examples of these, right? So um, for instance, there is, we have the abstract concept of a number, like the number three, but there might be real life incarnations of the number three, like three apples or three triangles or three whatever, right? And they're kind of the same thing, but they're a different viewpoint uh, on the same beast, basically, right? And um, so, the same is true for something like a finite group, say. You have a finite group, there's an abstract definition of a finite group. Um, basically, you could define a finite group by writing down a multiplication table for the group. But there are also real life incarnations of the same, same thing. Um, like, it, it usually groups appear in, in, in the wild as, as symmetry groups of certain things. Like, um, in my little example here, this is just a symmetric group. Uh, in, in four letters on four strands, whatever you want to call it, and it, it turns up as, let's say, the, the symmetry group of this funny little guy here, which is a tetrahedron. And this is how people discovered it, right? So um, in my analogy upstairs, so all of you had the concept of what three apples are way before you really were aware of what, what an abstract concept of a number is, like the number three. Um, animals can understand what, what three symbols are, but I don't know, but probably they don't have any abstract concept um, of, of numbers. And for finite groups, it's kind of the same thing. They, they, in practice, in the wild, when you work in mathematics, they usually appear in, in some incarnation, which is not the abstract incarnation, which is more like a, the symmetry group of certain objects, or in a more combinatorial fashion, like this is a permutation diagram. You can, you can think of it like, like a a permutation group appears as a card shuffling group or in many, many other flavors, whatever. Those incarnations are really uh, manifold. And kind of experience tells us that the same happens for, so this is the, the, the third row is a slice I'm basically going to talk about a little bit today. The same happens for other mathematical objects, right? So there is, for instance, the, the special linear group for me today, just SL2, which is just well, two by two matrices with determinant one. That's kind of the abstract definition. And on this slide, I'm a little bit sloppy with my scalars. I, I will tell you a little bit more about the scalars later. But for now, it's just this abstract definition. It's two by two matrices with determinant one. But of course, it has real life incarnations. It, for instance, acts on, on certain geometrical objects like a nilpotent cone. So this is a certain nilpotent cone. Or it acts, um, 
on R2 or like whatever in some some two dimensional space uh, by 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 its by its incarnation as matrices. Like in this case, in my example, an element of SL2 that you all know very well would be a kind of a rotation action. Um, and again, I'm kind of thinking about this side. We'll see this in a second. Um, and you can do the same for, for everything. And what usually turns up in, in my research are more like the algebras, algebras, categories, whatever. They, they always have some, um, some abstract definition. This is called the Weil algebra. Um, whatever it is, in, in the real life incarnation, it's kind of an algebra of, of certain differential operators, um, which come up. So this is a picture of the Leibniz rule. So multiplication by x, and then taking the differential by x is the same as doing the other way around, but you pick up an error term, and the error term is this little green box here, if you want to think about it. Um, but it also appears in, in kind of quantum mechanical context, and so on and so on. And the whole idea of representation theory is, okay, whatever you like to study in mathematics, in whatever it is, in most of the time, almost always, you are on the right-hand side of this, of this table. You are in, 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 in this column. Most of the time, you see the number three, uh, maybe not as three apples, but as something, as three something, three triangles, whatever. Most of the time, you see a finite group um, acting on a manifold, acting, acting on something. Most of the time, you see a Lie group in some geometrical con uh, context acting on whatever. And the whole idea of representation theory, and this is how I want to think about representation theory, is that eventually everything will be known by the actions. Okay, there is an abstract definition that's, that's absolutely great. So it, it, it enables us to think abstractly about the number three, but eventually everything kind of appears in some kind of real life incarnation as a symmetry group acting on a certain space or whatever, as three apples. And kind of the idea of representation theory, which is basically the core of my whole research, is to study this right-hand side of the table using the power of linear algebra. Okay? So one of the most successful... Linear algebra is, is pretty young as a field, if you think about it, like compared to number theory or algebraic geometry or, or whatever. They are much older fields of mathematics or, or analysis. Uh, linear algebra is extremely new. It kind of came up at the beginning of the last century, and it was just so ridiculously successful that nowadays I, I can't think about living without linear algebra anymore. And so if I would have to describe, and I'm describing right now, representation theory to you, then it's basically, well, I, have, I, I think most mathematical objects appear while their actions on something appear in nature, in some incarnation, and that might be a little bit wild to study, but why not linearize everything and use, use really the power of linear algebra to do things? So that's, that's the main philosophy of representation theory, in, in my opinion. Um, I would be much more explicit in a second, but that's really kind of uh, the main idea of representation theory. Study, let's say, actions of groups, like symmetries of groups, in some linear algebra way, because well, I like matrices. I hope you like matrices as well. That's all I'm saying. Study something that is not linear in a, in a linear way using the power of linear algebra. So in some sense, the representation theory, theory approach works as follows. It, it, it really is just the idea to reduce a non-linear problem. Studying a Lie group. A Lie group is, is well, studying a finite group. A finite group is certainly a non-linear object and try to study it via its incarnations on, on some, some, some nice linear space, like, like, like a vector space and whatever. And kind of the main idea would be um, that you have some, some group coming up in nature, acting on something nice, uh, coming up in, in acting on a, a symmetry group of a molecule or whatever, so like in chemistry, you know. And you linearize the problem, it's kind of general philosophy, now we have linear algebra, which basically means now you have matrices and you kind of decompose the problem into, into, into the simple instances you can see. They're usually called the simple modules. We'll come back to them in a second. They're like the elements of your theory. And this decomposition might tell you something new um, 
about the original problem itself. That's, that's the whole representation theory approach, right? Let me, let me just say it again, because I think it's important. So you have something, whatever. If you don't like groups, replace it with something else. Something, something coming to you um, by nature is given to you as a symmetry of, of a molecule of whatever. And as a representation theorist, the first thing I would do is I would linearize and look how those things act as matrices on, on, on vector spaces, basically. Just, this is just what you see here on the right-hand side. Um, and then you have the power of linear algebra, show this explicitly in some examples in a second, to kind of study the problem from a different perspective. You can decompose it further into simpler blocks, and maybe those simpler blocks will eventually tell you something about the problem you started with. So this is roughly a summary of what a representation theory is in the end all about. Uh, linearizing a problem, studying a problem, why are its actions? Um, in a little bit more formal perspective, so representation theory nowadays goes back to two of my heroes, so for Benius and Burnside, it's about 120 years ago by now, and they probably just proposed the following idea. Uh, they proposed the idea that, well, both of them liked finite groups. So finite groups were very popular. Well, they're still very popular, but they were in particular very popular 120 years ago. And they kind of said, okay, we like to study finite groups by just having a representation or module, which is just a, a, an, a my M here is just an assignment of, uh, for each group element, you assign a matrix on a certain vector space and the matrices multiply together as exactly in the same way as the group elements multiply together. So you have linearized the problem instead of having a group, you now have a bunch of matrices um, as endomorphisms arising on, on, on some vector space. Um, before I go to those examples, let me just, let me just click on this funny link here um, because I want to take a slightly different perspective than Frobenius and Burnside would have done um, because I'm a representation theorist after all. So this is just how they started the problem. Um, so Frobenius sort of thought about it something like 120 years ago and he really wanted to understand groups. And he wanted to understand groups via, its via their incarnations as matrices. Okay? And Burnside commented on this at one point, so in his, in his uh, book on groups, uh, Theory of Groups of Finite Order, which was published in 1897, and the, the, the top slice here is, is from the introduction of this book. And what he says is the following, so the, the underlined uh, sentence here, it would be difficult to find a result that could be most directly obtained by consideration uh, by the consideration of groups of linear transformations. And groups of linear transformations is just his, his word for, for representation theory. In other words, he basically says the representation theory is completely useless for the study of finite groups. Right? It would be most difficult to find a result that could be uh, directly obtained by the considerations of representations. And he's talking about finite groups. And nowadays he is known as one of the one of the founders of representation theory itself. And indeed, he completely changed his mind. So he, he, he had a second edition a few years later, so fourteen years later, and he, he basically completely changed his mind. In fact, it is now more true to say that for further advances in the abstract study, one must largely look at to the representations of a group as a group of linear substitutions. Again, his work for representation theory. So he basically says. The uh, group theory can't advance without, without representation theory. And this is exactly the approach I just told you. Um, you have a problem that comes to you, like you want to understand finite groups. Uh, that, that what Probenius originally proposed, and Burnside just jumped on the train, um, is that you, you really should look at, look at them as, as kind of a linear object by, by studying the actions of vector spaces um, as matrices. So that's the classical idea of representation theory of, of, let's say, of finite groups. It applies to many other setups, whatever, algebras, whatever. I, however, want to take a, a less prominent approach. I want to take a slightly different, so that's what I just said. So 
it, it's, it, it's, it, it's really a key ingredient in many discoveries in, in modern mathematics. I want to take, however, a, a slightly different approach. Um, I'm talking about SL2, right? So studying SL, SL2 is, SL2, these are already a collection of matrices. And studying it for the sense of learning something new uh, about SL2 is, is a little bit of a silly game, right? So I'm studying, I want to study SL2 uh, by, by looking at how it acts as matrices, which probably won't tell me much about SL2 itself. But it turns out, and this is kind of the, the very the kind of this miracle, which is not really clear to me why, but it turns out that the representation theory of SL2 is actually more important and much more interesting than, than SL2 itself, which is really kind of a different perspective from um, I want to study a group uh, by looking, I want to learn more about the group by looking uh, at, at, at um, on, uh, as, as, as how it acts uh, uh, as matrices, it, it's really, really a different approach. Like, I, I don't care about SL2. I really care about the representations of SL2. It will turn out to be more interesting and much more interesting than SL2 itself. Okay, um, let me go back. So here you have an example. So here, down here. So SL2, okay, um, the general philosophy is whatever you have, Maybe a group, maybe an algebra, but whatever, whatever life gives you, just send it to matrices and study it, its actions as matrices. So for SL2, there, there is certainly one action all of you could write down. Well, SL2 are matrices, right? So let's say you have real coefficients, then SL2 better acts, a matrix better acts as a matrix, right? So the, the, the representation is in some sense very silly, in some sense... Uh, very interesting is called the defining representation or the vector representation. So SL2 acts on on R2 as matrices. This is and here's an example like this is the action of this rotation matrix on R2. It, it it's really just rotating things by uh, in this case I hope something like 180 degrees. But the whole idea I want to sell and which is Basically, the core of my 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 uh, research is that I'm not. I mean, all of us understand SL2, right? SL2 two by two matrices determinant one, but it might have some interesting actions on other vector spaces. So by, for example, on R2, on R2 there is a representation which I'm going to explain to you in a second, um, which com looks completely different. For example, this matrix, which was a rotation matrix before, now acts as such a matrix on R3, which kind of looks like this. So it's not a really rotation anymore. It goes a little bit like all over the place. It, it, it's kind of completely different um, in nature than the, than the left-hand side of the picture. It's, all I've done is I'm, 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 I was varying my vector space and I got a, a, a new in, potentially interesting uh, mathematical object. Again, I don't really care about SL2, but I really care about those representations. Yeah. Two very fundamentally different uh, incarnations of the same group, right? So going back to my slide from before, I really care about the various different incarnations. I don't care so much about the right-hand side, right? SL2 is SL2, but I really care about the, the various incarnations. You will see it in life. Okay, so let me summarize and then I will go to SL2. Um, in, in more details. Um, so the main idea of which underlies all of my research is that I'm, in, in the end, representation theory is just a fancy word for, for linear algebra. Um, so you have a nonlinear problem, you want to study it in a, in, a, in a linear way, that's the idea of representation theory. Uh, it turns out, which is absolutely not obvious to begin with, that in some sense the representations are more interesting than um, the, the object you want uh, you you started uh, you started with, and that's what you call representation theory. You study those representations, well, ju just as being representations, as just as what they are, and you hope for some interesting patterns, some interesting things you can say about them, um, whatever. And in the long run, someone will pick it up because whenever you do something that is reasonably beautiful, that it. It's some, in some sense, it's part of nature and someone will pick it up and will use it. And then representation theory will be all over the place as it already is uh, nowadays. 
let me stress again that this philosophy applies not just to SL2, but basically to everything. And uh, what I usually do in my research is something like SL2. You can study Lie algebras, Lie groups, uh, whatever, finite groups, or even categories or some fancy things. It doesn't matter. You kind of want to linearize everything and you hope for um, that the representations themselves are more interesting than the pro problem you started with, which is in a lot of cases is true. In particular in what I'm going to tell you about today, because otherwise I wouldn't sitting here and uh, giving this talk, obviously. Okay, so let me go to SL SL2 and let me run you through it, through, through everything you know, know about SL2 basically. Um, which is not too much, but it's, it's still it's, it's still nice. You will see some nice pictures. So here are already some nice pictures, which I'm going to explain in this talk. So um, in my research, I'm basically focused on on those three bullet points. So uh, let me just let me just tell you about them. You don't need to read it. Um, so you can ask, what what about let's say finite dimensional representations? I use the, by the way, I use the word modules and representations. Uh, at, in exchangeably, so modules is just shorter, so I usually write modules on uh, on my slides, but you, you can think of representations anyway. So, um, can you study it in the in the setup of, of, of the classical groups? And in the setup of classical groups, I mean Lie groups and whatever the, the modules and their their, their structures. Um, there's another question you can ask. You can ask, uh, can I study them in the context, the more fancy context of, let's say, Hopf algebras, which basically means, well, you can tensor representations together. Can you say anything about tensoring of representations? There's, there's another layer of structure, which is, which is in some sense higher than this one. So the first one is kind of, the first question you would ask is um, something like, can I write down dimension formulas for my, for my representations? The second question is more like, can I write down decomposition numbers? How rep representations decompose um, um, for, for, my, for my representations? And the third question, which I'm not going uh, into any details today, is um, can you study them in a more categorical level? Can you tell me something about morphisms of representations and, and their structure? Um, but let, let me tell you that the answers to all of these cases are, are very nice in the, in, in, in the sense I'm going to explain. And it turns out that, well, I, I will explain it in characteristic zero, so the classical case. So your field is the complex numbers. Um, or anything like the complex numbers. Uh, but actually the most interesting things happen in, in some for, some for some finite fields or algebraic disclosures, so characteristic P, algebraic disclosures of, of finite fields. And what will happen is, and this is what I'm going to explain, and that's really kind of the core of my research in some sense, what you will see are, are very nice combinatorial patterns. In this case, you will see fractals. So like, like this one or, or this one, and I'm, I'm going to explain how they arise and what these pictures mean. And it will be a lot of fun, so I hope. Um, okay, before I explain kind of the first picture and how do we get there, uh, let me just mention that uh, I, I gave a very similar talk uh, a few weeks ago and someone mentioned to me that actually I should tell you about inverse fractals and not fractals. Let me just explain what this means. So if you usually think about fractals, you have something like a Mandelbrot set in mind or, or a Julia set or something like this. So this usually means if you zoom in, you see the original picture on a, on a smaller scale. Uh, what I will show you are strictly speaking inverse fractals. So I zoom out and I see the original picture on, on, a, on a bigger scale. Okay, so inverse fractals. Um, but anyway, I just will use the term fractals because uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I never heard about, heard about inverse fractals before, before someone, someone told me that's actually uh, uh, an established terminology. Okay, so goal for the rest of the, the, the talk, the, the next 30 minutes, I will explain how uh, fractals arise naturally by studying SL2. Okay, yes. This is exactly the takeaway message. Um, so representation theory of SL2 in, in finite characters, in, in, in characteristic zero, which I usually will call characteristic infinity, it's like you have a very, very large P, whatever. It, it, it's always a complex numbers. Is, is, is well studied and, and really well known for ages. 
And as soon as you go to characters to be, you're kind of secretly doing some kind of fractal geometry. And it's really ill understood. It, it's really beautiful, but, but still we don't understand. Basi- we understand basically nothing about it. Um, so like if you would ask the same questions for SL3 that I'm going to, to answer, which is the next easiest case you can imagine, that people don't know the answer. It, it's absolutely clear that you will see again fractal structures, but they will live in higher space and people really don't know the answer to, to the question. Anyway, um, so let me run you through it. So ju- it's just SL2, so don't be afraid. You can stay with me until the rest of the talk. It's just SL2. Um, and I want to write down basically vector spaces on which SL2 can act. And I'm following the approach of one of my heroes. So Hermann Weyl did this um, about a hundred years ago by now. And this idea is as follows. So uh, you will see those modules or those representations which are called delta. And they depend on, 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 on a certain natural number, um, which is uh, usually the dimension. Okay, so you can, for, for each natural number, you have uh, one of these modules, and I will explain in a second why I will write them as v minus 1. So this is just delta 0, delta 1, delta 2, delta 3, delta 4, delta 5, delta 6. But the v here is the dimension. So this is of dimension 1, this is of dimension 2, this is of dimension 3, this is of dimension 4, and so on. And his approach is the following. Um, he said, uh, Emma Weil said, okay, for, for each dimension I have a representation. So I, I can act with SL2, and this is really now, let's say, over the complex numbers or over the real numbers. I can act with SL2 on uh, whatever, let's say, four dimensional vector space. This is this slice here as follows. I just think of my vector space as being polynomials into variables, uh, x and y, and my basis is given by all polynomials of a fixed degree, in this case degree 3, right? In degree 3 I have x cubed, uh, I have x uh, squared y, I have x uh, y squared and I have y cubed. And he says, okay, the action works as follows, and this was exactly the one I, I showed you here, before for for um, for dimension three, the action works as follows: the matrix A B C D, and I will be ex- extremely explicit in the example in a second. The matrix A B C D acts as the matrix uh, whose rows expansions are exactly those um, e- expansion of those products. So A times X plus C times Y, and B times X plus D plus Y, and the dimension will show up in the uh, in the exponent. I will be very explicit in a second. So, um, so here's the example for dimension. What is it? Uh, seven. Okay. So how does it work? So this funny little matrix will act as follows. So in the top row, okay, you will just expand um, what is it? A x plus uh, c y to the uh, sixth power, which means you just write down the binomial coefficients and and you flank them accordingly with, with A and, and A's and C's. You do exactly the same for the last row, but, but for, for this part. And in the middle, you have some, some inter- intermediate pictures. Right? You just expand this polynomial. You think of every row as corresponding to one of those basis elements. And um, you just write down the coefficient in front of the corresponding uh, basis element. And this gives you an action or an, an action of SL2 uh, on a whatever dimensional vector space. It works in any dimension. So it gives you an action of SL2 for uh, any V, and these are the so-called vial modules. Right? So the delta modules, I will, also, I will call them delta modules, they are the so-called vial modules. They're just given by expanding, binomi- uh, expanding uh, um, uh, polynomials, basically. So you will see binomials all over the place. You should recognize here the binomial numbers. So one, one is six over zero, six over one, six over two, six over three, six over four, six over five, and six over six, and some mixtures in between. Until you get back to six over one, six over, sorry, six over zero, six over one, six over two, and so on. So it's actually not so hard to write them down. And Hermann Weil did this, as I said, or 120 years ago. And then you would like to, then you would like to study them.
And what it basically means is the following. You want to play some linear algebra games um, on, those, on, the, on those matrices, on these huge matrices you see here. And what Hermann Weil did is the following. It, it's not quite obvious, but it's also not so super hard to, to see that this module in, in general for any dimension, you will not, you will not find a common eigensystem um, for ABC, so independent of ABCD. And that basically means you don't have any substructures. So the, the fancy terminology is, or the terminology used in representation theory is that this guy is, is a simple module of SL2. It's, it's a simple, like a simple group. It's the simplest possible incarnation of SL2. Um, so there is no common eigensystem. It's a simple module. And um, what he showed 120 years ago, that all of these delta modules are simple modules of SL2. So for each dimension, you have exactly one. And um, there are no other simple modules. So you basically wrote down the, uh, um, the a periodic table, if you want to think about the, the symbols as being the elements, the periodic table of, of simple SL2 modules. Okay, that's pretty cool. I mean, that's pretty good for, for someone 100 years ago, with basically without any machinery at hand. Um, but he went a step further. He also analyzed a little bit of what's happening in, 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 in finite characteristic. He never pushed this any further, and it took until the 70s um, of the last century before people really really uh, kept, kept asking more questions and pushing things further. But basically what he did is, um, if you study the same module, this one in characteristic 2, you can just reduce it. So it, this module is defined integrally, so you can just reduce it mod 2. Like the, like the 20 here will just die, will become a zero. 10 and 10, they will die. Uh, 4, 12, 4, they will die, all divisible by 2, and so on. And this is then how the matrix looks like. And you still have this action, just now it lives in characteristic 2. And you observe that here in the middle, we have this um, funny looking column. And actually, this one is a common eigenvector for all ABCD. It doesn't matter what ABCD is, this one is a common eigenvector. This is, in this case, pretty, pretty, pretty obvious to see because you basically have a zero, zero column. There's only one entry which is not zero, and this is, of course, so the eigenvalue might vary, but the eigenvector is the same. And this really just means we have found a one dimensional submodule. You have found a subgroup in your group. Uh, so this is not simple anymore. Just because, well, for the very easy reason, you have this huge matrix, and now in finite characteristics, something funny happens with the eigenspaces. Right? The eigenspaces sub might differ um, in, in finite characteristic. Right? If you take, would just take this now mod 3, then something different would happen. You would find different common eigensystems. If you would take this mod uh, 7, then again something different would happen, and so on and so on. So you basically already studied that. Um, and then kind of the question he answered is the gave criterion when, when those guys are simple. Um, and it's a very nice answer, actually. So um, they are simple if and only if the corresponding binomial coefficients do not vanish. Right? The binomial coefficients is what you see here, um, turning up in the, in, the, in the rows of this matrix. And the, a little bit surprising answer is that whatever you do in the middle doesn't really matter. You only have to look at the first row. And if those numbers are divisible, divisible by p, then you're basically dead. And you can construct a, a, a common eigensystem now. And the funny thing is you can nail down precisely when this happens. This basically never happens um, because there's something like, well, like some, some classical number theory uh, uh, theorem. It's called the Lucas theorem. So um, binomials modulo P, that's what you need to check, are just the products of the binomials of the digits if you express your number periodically. So here's my dimension. I express it periodically. So here, let's say A is my dimension. I express it periodically. A i times p to the i, and my binomial is just the, the product of the coefficients. So this happens if and only if there's just one digit which is not which is not zero. Uh, one digit which is uh, not zero. So only only in those cases. So basically never. And so that's what what was already known to Hermann Weyl, as I said in the in the twenties of the last century, and. Well, people start to think about it a little bit more, and they wrote down now all the simple modules in characteristic P. 
Right? It, let, let me t say it again. In characteristic zero, none of these guys have any common eigensystem, and these are all simple modules. And it turns out that the classification in um, in characteristic P is is slightly different. So those guys are not simple anymore, but they will contain simple submodules. So the, you still have one simple for for each natural number. So you have one element for each natural number, and now comes the interesting part about it. They, they behave in a very nice way. So this is Pascal's triangle. This is just the starting point of Pascal's triangle, right? This is built by using the binomial coefficients. So this should be, you should think about this as being um, Pascal's triangle, basically. Just, you just have an action of SL2 on Pascal's triangle. And the characteristic P, the funny thing that happens is that um, the simples now, so this is now my characteristic P, a uh, picture of the same from before for p equals 5. So it starts off as Pascal's triangle. So the delta module stays simple up to a certain point. So this is the delta module. And it's just the whole, it's just the whole, whole line. It's just the, the whole picture. And the, um, the simple in the delta module it behaves as follows. So up to a certain point, it stays the same. And here, for instance, uh, the, the simple, which corresponds to the delta module of dimension six, has now here an eigensystem turning up in the upala, sorry, turning up in the um, in the first and the last column. The next one has an eigensystem turning up in the first, the second, and the two last columns, and so on. And the funny fact is, and that's what 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 people already knew since. Uh, since the 70s, is that this whole thing arranges itself now in the Pascal's triangle modulo P, which is my first fractal for today. So this little part here upstairs, so where everything is uh, kind of whitish or, or cream colored or whatever it is, um, this is this little triangle up here. Okay, this black area is exactly where, where the symbol differs from the, from, from the standard module, from the vial module, this is black area. And it, 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 uh, it is this pattern. So the simple up to a certain point is just everything and then it, it dies in the middle and it, here is another one and this pattern continues up to infinity. So here is a simple for instance it just is of dimension 2 while the uh, while module is of dimension whatever this, the length of this line would be. Uh, and this is how it continues. I mean. This is pretty cool, in my opinion. So, like, um, so basically, what what Hermann Weil says is, um, the simple modules of SL two, right? They're interesting. They're much more interesting than SL two itself, in some sense. Um, if you are doing characteristic zero, so complex numbers, then they are just Pascal's triangle in one incarnation or the other. If you are studying um, characteristic P, they will be Pascal's triangle modulo P. So this is really just Pascal's triangle modulo 5. So whenever you would write down Pascal's triangle and you see something that is divisible by 5, you, you just erase it and it will get black. Right? So this is nothing else. And the simple modules of, of SL2 in finite characteristic behave exactly in the same way. Which, which I think is, is a pretty amazing starting point for um, modular representation theory. It's kind of the easiest example you can think of, and it, 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 it's still a pretty beautiful pattern. But Pascal's triangle model. Okay, um, and as I said, this was basically known to Hermann Weil. People have written it down in the 70s. But in principle, this is known for whatever 100 years. And since Hermann Weil is one of my heroes, uh, I think I at one point decided to study this further, and um, so let me tell you a little bit more what you what kind of fractals you you can produce from from SL2. So again, the, the starting point, the easiest question you would ask is, well, what are the simple modules? What are the elements of the theory? And oh, you get the answer. They behave like Pascal's triangle modulo P, which is my my first inverse fractal. And you, if you're just like me, then you would hope, yeah, maybe you get more fractal, more nice pictures to draw if you study slightly more difficult modules of SL2. And that's exactly what's going to happen. Um, without running you through all the details, let me just basically 
tell you the results. So there's another class of modules which some of you might know, some of you might, might never seen. It doesn't really matter. There's, there's a nice class of modules called tilting modules. And they're much younger than the theory uh, Hermann Weil explained. So the definition is, is really not obvious. It's a little bit tricky. I'm not going into details. It, it doesn't really matter. It's one of those definitions. If you see them for the first time, it's like, like, like a, what the fuck? Why should I care? Why is it should be interesting? But they're really well behaved. Okay. So whatever the definition is, they're really well behaved. And there's another class of those representations and they're indexed by the same thing, namely by the natural numbers. And they're called tilting modules. Um, just because of the reason they're kind of built like, if you tilt, so they, they look a little bit like a, like a triangle. They have those delta modules sitting inside of them. There's kind of the core delta modules, which are, which, which are these nabla things. And the tilting modules are kind of built that in, in, in a certain way that if you tilt your head, then it still looks the same. So if, I, if you would now uh, turn your head by whatever 180 degrees, then the whole picture will still look the same. Um, again, I won't go into any details. It doesn't matter so much. The definition is very mysterious if you see it for the first time. But it basically plays a role, if you, if you know what, what I'm talking about, it basically plays a role of projective modules for assets. And they're just much, much better behaved than, than the projective modules themselves. Um, and the only thing you really need to take away from, from this slide, except that there's another cl nice class of modules you would like to study, is that in, in characteristic, so over C, uh, they are just, the, the tilting modules are the simple modules, so L was my notation for the simples. Are the delta modules, are the whatever, the nabla modules, which I haven't, I haven't told you what they are, but there's another class of modules, the nabla modules. They're all the same, you don't see a difference. In, in characteristic P, you will see a difference. And if you know this analogy, and uh, sorry, if you know the story about the simples, you might just ask the same questions for, for the tilting modules. Right? Another natural class of modules, um, let's say God gave them to you or Ringle Donkin gave them to you, it's another natural class of modules, you would like to ask the same questions. Maybe their dimensions and their characters also behave in a, in a fractal-like pattern. And the answer is, yes, they do. And that's what I'm going to show you now. So just keep in mind, there's a natural class of modules. Uh, I just denote them by T, and they're called tilting modules, whatever. And um, yeah, so you can, you can answer all of these questions. In particular, you can, you can ask how often, um, so basically you want to write down a character for, this, for this, so a dimension formula for those modules, and you can ask how often those delta modules appear. So let me just say, if you would know how often those delta modules appear, you could write down the dimension. Okay, so the natural question here is, if I have my T, and it is built out of a lot of those delta modules, um, so can you nail down precisely uh, what delta modules appear? And the answer is, again, very nice. So um, this is probably the biggest number, I, uh, biggest number I've ever had on any on, on my slides. So if you would like to know, so this is a really huge module. It's, it's bigger than whatever, 220,540. It's it, because it contains the, the 200,000, well, whatever, 200,240 dimensional module, but other stuff, it's so, so it's bigger than, than, than this number. And you can still tell explicitly what its dimension is and what its characters are and so on and so on. And it turns out that the answer is extremely nice. It works as follows. So you take your number, 200 whatever, you express it periodically. So I hope I did this correct. So I just whatever. So this will be in a characteristic 11. So one plus seven times 11 plus seven times 11 cubed. Okay, nothing. Uh, seven times 11 squared, nothing. 4 times 11 to the 4th and uh, 11 to the 5th is, I hope, this number. And the factors that appear are, take this number and allow inverting digits. You don't want to uh, invert the leading digit because then you would get a negative number and you already know that everything is indexed by, by positive numbers. So, but you're allowed to invert all other digits. For example, this one would appear. Okay. Um, 
which gives you a very, 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 exp I mean, it might be a bit fast right now, but it's a very explicit formula. You have one number and you just co compute its, um, its periodic expansion. You turn around some digits, which I call the negative digit game. And th this gives you the, the, the character formula, the dimension formula, basically, for those tilting modules. And if you're like me, and well, you believe me by now that there is some fractal geometry going on, the first thing you would do is you would feed it into some graphical computer algebra program and um, uh, plot some nice diagram. So those are exactly those numbers. So um, along uh, the row, uh, sorry, uh, the, the rows, I would have my, my tilting modules and along the columns, I would have my delta modules. And I ask how often do things appear like this one, this delta tilting module for this number, which is roughly 101, I guess, um, would have everything along the same horizontal slice appearing, okay? So there is something around 95 maybe, and there's something around 60, and there's something around whatever, whatever it is, 55. And well, whatever it is, it's just it's just another fractal. It's, it's this kind of whatever you want to call it, um, tree-like thing. So it will continue forever and I hope you see the fractal pattern. So here you have three and a, a lack of length three turning out. Here's the next lack of length nine. The next, so this by the way characteristic is three. So the next lack is of length, length 27. This lack is I hope of length 81. And down here will be one of length uh, pff, whatever the next power of three is and so on and so on. Right? It's an inverse fractal. I zoom out and I, and I see the same thing scaled by P. Um, and the surprising fact is this was kind of a new, in, in some sense, a new observation. Uh, so there's uh, still a lot of lot to discover about uh, SL, SL2 on, on this level. So the only thing I did, let me, let me repeat it, I just took another um, natural class of modules you have to believe me that this is a natural class of representations, a natural class of, of actions of SL2. And I, I just asked some, some question like what are the dimensions and I get this pretty nice answer. So this would tell me um, how the dimensions um, behave in, in characteristic uh, three. And if you ask yourself now, oh wait, what is now the answer for characteristic zero? Well, it's as follows. So this first leg here, appears after three steps, and the three is exactly characteristic P. And if you think of the complex numbers as being characteristic infinity, then the first lag will appear somewhere here at infinity, so never, and this whole thing is just a straight line. Right? So the classical theory is just a straight line. The characteristic P theory is this beautiful um, uh, fractal tree-like pattern. A really good reason for me to to uh, uh, study representations uh, of, of, of SL2, in this case, in characteristic, in characteristic P. Just, you, really, you really see very surprising and kind of very beautiful um, fractal structures turning up. Okay, let me wrap up um, by telling you a little bit more. Of course, in the last five, five to 10 minutes, um, I, I can only be very brief, but t let me tell you that this is, is not the end. There are way more and very interesting fractal structures hidden already just in SL2. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's SL3 to go, there's whatever to go. And it is just amazing. And I, I hope you share partially by um, enthusiasm. Um, okay, so without going too much into details, those tilting modules, um, also form a very nice uh, collection. They're kind of the nicest things you can cook up with. Um, the, the, the fancy terminology is they form kind of a monoidal category. So you can tensor them together and you still get a module of the same type, which is just not true for anything else you try with SL2. So kind of tilting modules are the only things that have kind of a multiplication structure on them. And whenever you have a multiplication structure, what you would like to answer is, can you write down basically the structure constants, right? So if, can I write down the structure constant tendering my, my, my tilting module for a certain number with a tilting module of another number? I know that I will stay in, my, in the same category, so I will know that it expands in some tilting modules, 
but a times b let's say it's a basis so a times b will expand in in the basis and you're asking for what are the structure constants in this basis and they are sometimes called what well, whatever fusion fusion constants because originally they the actually come from come from physics anyway it's 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 a very simple question like you have an algebra that's basically what i'm saying i have an algebra given of those tilting modules and i'm asking for what are the structure constants uh, of this algebra and I hope by now you will believe me that the answer is, is, is pretty nice. So let me let me just explain how it works. Um, and don't worry too much if you don't get too many of the details. I hope I hope you will still like 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 some nice pictures. Um, so the idea here is as follows: instead of writing down a, a huge bunch of, of of numbers, the structure constants, I can encode them in a graph. And this graph is called the fusion graph, um, and it works as follows. So you write down a, a vertex for each tilting module, basically. So a vertex for each of your um, e each of your basis elements, and you add edges corresponding to, to the action of of, uh, of of your of, of your of your uh, algebra element of your tilting module. Here in my baby example, um, it's as follows. So let's let's just say for simplicity, I only have two things. Right? I only have one and x. And the only rule I know is that x squared, this is just a funny symbol for x squared, is 1 plus x. Okay? That's the only thing I know. And then I could write down those fusion graphs, and I have two of them. I have one for 1, and I have one for x. And they look as follows. I write down each, uh, one vertex for each of my objects, one for, one for 1 and one for x. And I look how uh, 1 multiplies and x multiplies. Right? 1 times 1 is 1. I haven't written it down, but I hope, I, well, I hope it makes sense to say 1 times 1 is 1. So 1 times 1 is 1. 1 times x is x. So this is a, this is a fusion graph for 1. Right? 1 times 1 is 1, so I get a loop at 1. 1 times x is, is x, so I get a loop at x. Let's look at, that, look at the action of x. Again, I have two vertices, 1 and x. Uh, uh, x times 1 is x, so I draw an edge from 1 to x, because x times 1 is x. x times x, here's x times x, so x squared is 1 plus x, so I draw an edge to 1, and I draw an edge, or a, a kind of a loop on x. Okay, And I can play the same game with basically any algebra. I could, whatever you get, I, I put, I've chosen a basis, I write down um, uh, uh, vertices according to a basis element and I look at the structure constants by putting them basically uh, as labels on edges and I'm very very sloppy here because all the labels here are one so I just removed the labels. Right? But basically it's an idea to encode an algebra, the structure constants of an algebra in terms of a graph. Just edges correspond precisely to basically the structure constants. And you would ask the question, well what's going on now in my um, characteristic p case and there's one natural module you can write down and I, I, I told you about it uh, a while ago it's it's, uh, um, it's a SL2 acting as SL2 matrices on on the two-dimensional space and this is a fusion graph how it would look like for this element um, in, in over C so in characteristic infinity and it's a little video and you can see um, so let me make it a little bit bigger, maybe. Um, okay. So I, it's an infinite thing. So I have infinitely many tilting modules. I can't show you an infinite graph. So I decided to to make a video of how the graph looks like as, as, as I add more and more vertices to it. So all you see here is, for instance, if I would act, so if I multiply this one with two, I would get uh, a copy of one and I would get a copy of 3. That's exactly what those edges are encoding. If I multiply this one with 3, I get a copy of 4, and I got a copy of 2. And in characteristic two, in characteristic infinity for, for the complex numbers, nothing happens. Um, there's no fractal at all. It's just what it is. It gets bigger and bigger, and it closes into a circle eventually. It won't happen in my video, because my video is finite, of course. But, but I think you get the point. I mean, the whole action is basically a circle. Okay? 
the whole action graph is basically a circle. And I did the same for characteristic two. Um, and this is how it looks like. So it starts off, it starts off a little bit strange already. It looks a little bit different, but that's not the point. So you will see the point in a second. Um, just, just observe the following um, um, uh, kind of kind of pattern. You have one edge. You have two edges. You have one edge. Let's go a little bit further. You have two edges. You have one edge. Okay. So this seems to be like one edge, two edge, one edge, two edge, one edge, two edge. And as you go along, oh, there's a longer edge. So everything is now scaled on a longer level, uh, on, on a longer scale. It's a fractal. You will see it in a second. I let, just let it run. So here's longer edge, another one, another longer edge. And there's another one. This is now of, let me let, let's have a look at it. This, uh, well, no, let's look at the last one. So it goes on. Here's a longer one. And here comes the next one. And here it stops. So this is the small edges uh, that get scaled out, and this goes from uh, a power of two, it's, it's slightly off, it, it's slightly off, um, but it's basically a power of two down to another power of two. This is what those edges do. So they get longer and longer and longer. So this is of length, whatever it is, um, 32 basically. This is of length 16. The smaller ones you see right here, whoops. This is of length four, which is another power of two. Here comes the edge of length eight and so on. And this will, will, will of course continue forever. That's, that's why it's inverse fractal. So instead of having just a circle, if you run the same story in characteristic P, you get this, this funny uh, fractal graph like thing, which is longer and longer edges um, uh, popping up all the time. Okay, so yes. So this is exactly what I said. So you, you see those cycles uh, I have told you about that. The cycles are actually also of length p, and not just. So we have cycles of length p with edges jumping for the corresponding power of um, of p, repeating uh, in <coughs> in a longer and longer interval. So it, it really is this inverse fractal like thing, in contrast to to the above, which was just a circle. Okay, I'm already basically out of time, but um, you could you could play more games. Like you can write down um, Catan matrices of, of those things and you will see those beautiful patterns. So they're counting certain multiplicities in, in, in certain um, so-called value into categories. And it, 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 really, it really gets really beautiful. The colors here indicate um, um, the order of the multiplicity and not just the shape itself in this case repeats in a fractal way, but also the colors will repeat in a fractal way. And you get this, whatever it is. And, and, uh, a bigger getting arrow with a lot of smaller arrows inside and it's amazing and you continue this game for morphisms for, for whatever and you always see fractals turning up um, and I found this uh, very amazing um, yeah so more fractals you can you can do everything in sort of quantum groups um, in higher ranks, in higher dimensions, it's, it's pretty beautiful. In the end, it, it really wraps up in the sense that I just started with SL2, but if I look at the representations of SL2, I see those, those, those really beautiful fractals. Um, and yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about. Oops, thank you very much.